I, I trust everyone knows where that, um, that little starter slide is. Um, what I was asked to speak about by Malcolm is, um, here it is, the architecture of the University of Birmingham. In the time I've got, I can't go into the details, of, any details at all, of, it, of why it got built and why things happened in a particular period I'll be concentrating on the 1960s, except just to mention that they did almost. This is a look at the buildings and, what, and the physical fabric of the university and a little bit about the people who designed it. Um, I hope everyone knows where that is. I rather enjoyed taking that shot as I went round. It, it seemed to want to be taken. It's, the, it's the, uh, the dome of the entrance hall in front of the Great Hall of the old block, Chancellor's Court. Um, and if I start off, um, we need to go back beyond, um, beyond the current buildings to remind ourselves that once upon a time, this is my one nostalgic bit of the morning, uh, the old brum bit, um, once upon a time, this university was Mason College, named after Sir Josiah Mason, the great benef um, benefactor and philanthropist, made his money out of, out of pens. Um, it stood in Edmund Street, but the bit of Edmund Street that has vanished. If you know the bit of Edmund Street between the Council House and the Council House Extension, with the bridge going over it, Edmund Street used to go straight off in the other direction, where the Central Library now stands, the one that, 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 that has just closed. Um, and if you stood in front of Edmund Street facing the bridge, turned 180 degrees and marched up Edmund Street the other way, you would have had the old Victorian reference library on your left and this building on your right. It's a wonderful piece of Victorian Gothic by a marvellous architect called Jethro Cossins. Um, Cossins was the, the SPAB's first reporter in the Midlands and knew all people like William Morris and Philip Webb. Um, and Philip Webb's influence is sometimes visible in his work, not in this work, but some of the others. There are some wonderful houses left by him, including a gorgeous one, number 15 Westbourne Road, if you're ever in Edgebaston. Um, but this was one of his major works, very Victorian Gothic, came down in the 60s. Uh, but worth remembering that we did have a college, from which Joseph Chamberlain and others founded the university that we have now. And there's the, the classic view of the original part, Chancellor's Court, um, the quote underneath is, is from someone who, who I've not chosen accidentally. Um, Sir Hugh Casson, president of the Royal Academy, a very fine architect and a very fine watercolour artist, director of the Festival of Britain. So a, a modernist, but in some ways a gentle modernist. He did wonderful watercolours. He wrote a book on Victorian architecture, which now seems out of fashion, but was radical when it was written. Um, in certain lights, he said, it can look as magical as the domes of Istanbul or Moscow. I didn't have one of those wonderful sort of reflected light and cloud days in all the times I was going around the university. I was rather hoping I could get one and show you what he meant, but that's the best I can do, that group of domes standing around the Campanile in the Great Hall on the hill of the university. Uh, this is not the first slide that's going to get interrupted by enormous lighting columns, and I uh, apologise for that and only wish that the university could deal with the man who keeps putting them up. Um, but there it is. Aston Webb was a great establishment architect. Sir Aston Webb he was. Um, his most famous work in terms of being the work you always see is, of course, the current front of Buckingham Palace. Every time the Royal Coach comes out of Buckingham Palace or every time there's a royal occasion the Queen comes onto the balcony or the BBC reporter Nicholas which or somebody's outside that building with that classical front, you are looking at a piece of Aston Webb. Much derided over the years, it's actually a very clever rationalisation of a much older group of buildings behind it. Uh, he was not, uh, he, he did not have a free hand. It, it, does, it does a very wonderful classical job with the buildings he had. Uh, but this and the Birmingham Law Court earlier, that's one reason he got the university job, are two of his major works. Um, he was very much among what was then called the Terracotta School, more so on the law courts than, in the, the, than at the university. There was enough of it at the university. And the university is, is two things. In style, it's a very fashionable blend of, of, of mostly Jacobean, do you think, um, with hints of older classical styles, particularly in those Byzantine domes. That was very fashionable in, late, in the late Victorian and Edwardian period. Um, English Jacobean, the, the, the round arch windows with the, with the stone tracery, that kind of approach. 
uh, the use of brick, certainly not Gothic, but still brick, was the basis of the style, but, but a lot of classical detailing went into it. These were architects who went to architecture schools, and their first job was to draw the classical orders. And I mean draw them, not do them on a computer, draw, the, draw them with a pencil, um, in great detail to understand all their differences. Um, so anyway, there is the great front of the building, and a little bit of detail. It does group wonderfully as you walk round it. And here's just one casual bit of grouping as you walk round what the, the, the outside of Chancellor's Court uh, with the Campanile, I'll come to in a minute, and one of the domes and one of its side turrets. And you get a, a hint in that of what Sir Hugh Casson said, that it can look a bit as if you're in Istanbul or Moscow. And there's the plan. This is the other great influence on the university's buildings because this is not a Jacobean plan. Uh, it's a bit closer to being a Byzantine plan, but its real history is in the French tradition that we call the Beaux-Arts. Um, that's the academic tradition of French architecture, rooted in classicism, but involving, right from the days of um, the autocratic French monarchy of Louis XIV, no. um, a tremendous formality of plan. That everything uh, it, it, it is planned in a, in a tremendously symmetrical and organised way. In the, in the case of the university, it means that you have, uh, it's not quite a hemicycle, it's flattened, it's half of an oval form. Um, but a hemicycle will do half of this oval. Um, with the, I'm sorry, the drawing's got a little bit twisted at the bottom. It shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be that, that <coughs> obtuse, so it is slightly obtuse. Um, with the, the um, the loggia, the open arch loggia in the middle in front of the campanile, the loggia that's now the Harvey Law Library. Um, if I'm right, physics is on the left of this plan, was built, was built though slightly later, so it's marked dark. Chemistry is on, sorry, physics is on the left of this plan, chemistry is on the right. Uh, and then you can see the bits of the hemicycle that were built during the first few years marked in dark. As we'll come to at the end, there's a bit more of it built now. Um, the whole thing, as I said, is formal. It's an affair of axes and symmetry and lines. Uh, very much the French tradition. It was very much an Edwardian tradition in this country as well. Not so much in Birmingham, but in uh, first in Liverpool, and the work of Charles, Sir Charles Riley, the head of Liverpool School of Architecture, and all his pupils. Um, that tradition didn't hit Birmingham from Liverpool till 1960 with Shepard Fiddler, but, it, but, it, but it, it's very big elsewhere. If you want to look at it in London, I don't know where the best place it would be, it would be more in the, in the reverence they had for Nash, for his planning of Regent Street and Regent Park, not, not, not that they could imitate it much, but you get a whiff of it in places like the Euston Road or Northumberland Avenue. Um, right. Let's go on. So, so this tremendous formal planning. There's the outside, uh, and there particularly you can see this, this mixture of Jacobean, Byzantine, and probably something more in those great friezes by Anning Bell figures that run along in the brickwork. Uh, but the windows are essentially Jacobean. The turrets on the side of the Great Dome are also active Jacobean houses. You can go and see 17th century houses and they have turrets like that on. Not as Well, Aston Hall is not far off. Uh, but a, do a big dome in the middle, which is certainly out of Byzantium. And there, absolutely on axis, is the great Campanile. The Campanile, people tend to not notice this, because, particularly because the base is still in that classical going Jacobean uh, form, but the model for the Campanile is the Torre del Mangia in Siena. And this was one bit where, where Chamberlain did suggest something quite strongly to Aston Webb. Um, he and his wife had gone on an Italian holiday and were much taken by Torre del Mangia and, um, and asked Webb if he could model his Campanile on it, which he immediately did, though it's not a copy of it. And it fits very beautifully with the buildings around it. Incidentally, just on a side track, the Italian holiday from Birmingham um, is something that has its influence in other parts of, of Birmingham architecture, particularly the arts and crafts. 
Um, Bishop Gore, the first Bishop of Birmingham, who knew Chamberlain well, uh, was a man who took Mediterranean holidays to escape from his bishopric every year. <laughs> um, he's one of the, the, the great old-fashioned Anglo-Catholic priests who works like mad for 40, 49 weeks of the year and then goes off to the mayor to free. Um, and other, architecture, other arts and crafts architects, um, including A.S. Dixon, who was an Anglo-Catholic, was in a circle round Gore, followed him, and there's quite a, um, an early Christian Mediterranean influence in other Birmingham, in other Birmingham arts and crafts architecture, but this is earlier than that. Okay. And the Great Hall. Um, again, if, if, this has a, if this has a style, it's Jacobean, but no Jacobean hall ever had anything quite so wide and splendid as this. Uh, when it was built, there was much comment that it was actually slightly bigger than the Birmingham Town Hall. Um, articulated by those great big round arches that go over the top, balconies down each side with spaces underneath, so it's quite a spatial experience to wander around the Great Hall. It's the one point where Aston Webb as an architect moulds internal spaces as well as creating external ones. Um, but some wonderful plaster work by a man called George Bankart, who I'll come back to later. And there, funny enough, although the Great Hall is very grand, the entrance hall is my favourite because it does play with spaces and, and shapes so wonderfully. Uh, there it is. The dome I showed you right at the start is, of course, uh, above this. You can't quite get a picture of everything. But this is the ground floor with the, with the circular balcony of the first floor going round up above. Uh, a lovely row of columns and vaulting below it. Um, pendented to the dome vault up above and some very big... Uh, Jacobean lunette windows, half circle windows, uh, <coughs> lighting the first floor. It is a really rather splendid space and beautifully decorated. Uh, now we move on. We're still on the formal scheme, but this is where we start looking at the additions to the university. If you remember that Beaux Arts plan, it's significant that one of the earliest, it's small but it's important, additions to the university is by one Birmingham architect who certainly was a Beaux Arts man, and it continues Webb's scheme. Those modest piers and gates on Pritchett's Road are dead in line with the um, with the Campanile and the Hemis and the Great Hall, and were meant to be a grand entrance to the university until the library got built in the way. That by William Haywood of Buckland and Haywood, uh, and the ironwork of the gates is by the Birmingham Guild, who were very proud of it. In their catalog. Um, the style is classical Neo-Georgian going Art deco -y in those in those towers. It's, it's extremely eclectic, but the particular thing is the sheer formality of this. The lodge houses, by the way, are wonderfully designed. I'm sorry about the reflected sunlight on this shot, but that's to show you that they're actually convex. As you go through the gates, they open out so that you open out into a university precinct. It's quite subtly designed. Um, and also early, because Birmingham University didn't have colleges like Oxbridge, a building had to be provided for the students. Students in those days lived in digs, so an early, an early um, piece of work, largely funded by someone we'll see the memorial to in a moment, was the Guild of Students <coughs> building. This is Birmingham Arts and Crafts for Tea. It's by Holland Hobbis, the last great exponent of the Birmingham Arts and Crafts. And as you can see, it's a Tudor manor house of West Midlands type, most wonderfully um, souped up. Um, if you look at it, it's almost perfectly symmetrical, but the symmetry is very deliberately broken by a single chimney just to the left of that central gable and a tiny dormer further leftwards. The single chimney is a sort of hallmark of a particular stream of late Victorian <laughs> architecture. It starts at a very famous house for us architectural historians called Kinmel Park in North Wales by an architect called W. Eden Nesfield. Nesfield burnt himself out young, but his friend and contemporary Norman Shaw uh, carried on to become the great form giver of late Victorian architecture, and there is scarcely a building, this one included, which doesn't, doesn't, doesn't owe something to him. Hobbes, as a young man, actually knew Norman Shaw, 
And there's a lovely story of John Betjeman visiting Birmingham in the early 60s when Hobbes was still alive, being introduced to Hobbes and writing a nice letter to his host, Lady Zuckerman, afterwards about old Mr. Hobbes with his memories of Norman Shaw. He should be, he should be asked to write them down. Two years later, a lovely article by Hobbes appears in the BAA Green Book about his childhood memories of Norman Shaw, and I like to connect those two things. But this is a wonderful building. It's, it, the quality of the detail... And its massing is gorgeous. There it is from close to on the side, and you can see how the, how the front porch and the wings relate to one another. And inside, the details are sumptuous. This is a full imperial staircase, up in, up in a single blind, back in a double, and then up in a further single. Again, with plaster work, I think, well, I, we'll come to who might be the architect present, the, the answer to that presently. But it, it's a sumptuous neo Jacobean with lots of other details thrown in. Also, in the hallway, an absolutely gorgeous fireplace. This is particularly the fireplace which records the generosity in that inscription of Sir Charles Hyde, who paid for much of the Guild of Students. Uh, the proprietor of the Birmingham Post. Can you see those wonderful Delft style tiles which Hobbes has put into the fireplace? Something you don't know. Um, in the last four or five years, the rest of this building, apart from the staircase, this fireplace, and a couple of other fireplaces, has been systematically trashed. And I, I find what the university has done there really quite appalling. Um, teaching developments in the 1930s were mostly things like this. This is the physics department completing the, uh, the left hand, the eastern end of the hemicycle by Maurice Webb, uh, Aston Webb's... I don't think he was his son. He was his nephew, but don't blame me. 1935-7, it's the continuation <coughs> of the firm. Um, in a rather paler and thinner version of the hemicycle, but it'll pass muster. The 1930s did not have the financial resources of 1900. The world was different. Um, the greatest work of the 1930s, the grandest, um, which doesn't need a quick look here because it includes the medical school of the university, was the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. By Lanchester and Lodge, this is Beaux-Arts to an absolute T. If any of you know Cardiff, Lanchester, with his earlier partner, Rickards, was the architects of the Cardiff City Hall, the wonderful grade one, this building, which for me is the finest bit of Edwardian Baroque anywhere in Britain. And you know, you'd be hard put to find a better bit anywhere else. Um, here, the style is much more spare, but the formality is still there, with that great pylon entrance and the tower of the hospital immediately behind it. It's a beautifully detailed pylon entrance, if you go up to look at it, with that sort of stone mouldings framing that great window and the doorway. And it has a sculpture up top. Oh, could you also just notice those walls which look so plain are endless little recessings forward and back to give you an idea of the whole sort of plastic nature of, this, of the mass of the building. Um, and there is a wonderful piece of sculpture by the Esculapius by William Bloy. Bloy will ring through the next few slides of this. He was the finest Birmingham sculptor of the 20th century by a long way. Prolific, but always very good. And the university has several examples of his work. I could have started by pointing out the shield on the front of the Guild of Students, which is Bloy, and probably that plaster work on the staircase. But this is certainly him. Notice what a complex group of things it is, what a, what, what a, what a tremendous sculpture this was to bring off. It is an extraordinary thing that with Esculapius, the snakes... Um, I'm not quite sure why there's a beastie on the right as well, but he clearly has some symbolic purpose. Lots of mouldings and flowing drapery. It's almost like a sort of student's masterpiece. Um, but it, but it, there it sits above the medical school and no one takes any notice of it. Um, right. But the other building of the 1930s couldn't have been a greater contrast to the medical school. Also in its way, taking a nod to the Beaux-Arts, but here deliberately not symmetrical, though it is deeply imbued with classical tradition, the Barber Institute. Robert Atkinson isn't a sort of, even of an architectural historian, a, ha a household name, but he was in his time regarded as one of the best architects of the country. Sir Charles Riley is representing British Architects of the Present Day, which is the best contemporary book on 1930s British architecture, has a chapter on Atkinson, and so it should. This is his masterpiece. Um, I've deliberately used this watercolour. I don't know if anyone here knew the late John Sermon. But he used to do wonderful watercolours of buildings, and here he has used artistic licence not to show that awful glass roof that was put on in the 80s. Uh, so you have the Barber Institute as Atkinson intended it. If there's anyone here involved with the barber, I'd still love to see it removed one day. I'm told it doesn't work. Um, 
but is a very great building. The quality of the detail... Um, Atkinson was a very high-quality cinema architect. He did the very best ones in London for the church, places like that. Not the Edgington Square, but there are others at that kind of level. Um, and also the educational buildings. So there is just the touch of the very refined cinema about the concert hall. The wonderful wood veneer work. Can you see the the, um, the the sort of drapery-like shapes going along in the corners, which is all wood veneer? Um, I haven't got a list of all the wood veneers here. I can find it if anyone is a, is a great expert or wants to know about them. But, but you can see the patterns. Those, those cross patterns in the flanges of the proscenium arch are also all veneer. Um, the roof sets up in stages with hidden lighting behind each hidden step. Um, so it, in one sense, it's the cinema to end all cinema. Or 1930s theatre rental theatres, but it is, you know, it's still in the age of idealism. This is raised to high art, and it, it is a wonderful building. Um, after the war, very quickly, the, the period after the war, um, at first, is very traditional. This is Hobbes's extension to the Guild of Students, 1948-51. The source here is, well, here it's first of all Jacobean, rather, rather more than these Elizabethan manor house, to give a nod to the university hemicycle next door. Um, but the specific source of that Elizabethan or Jacobean building with those very big, if you can see them, ionic pilasters, they're ionic order, the capitals have volutes, uh, big brick pilasters, is Kirby Hall in Northamptonshire. Um, it may be that Hobbes was very aware of Kirby Hall because it was a conservation case of a celebrated <coughs> time between the wars. It fell into ruin, well, it had been in ruin many years, but the ruins were under threat from ironstone quarrying because it's close to Corby. Um, and in fact, in the end, um, Stuarts and Lloyds quarried all round it and left it standing. But in those days, before there was much building protection, it was, it was quite a conservation case. But anyway, the, the, the source of that wonderful back elevation, which is so different from the front, is, is Curly Hall. Um, a couple of other buildings from the 50s. Um, this is the end of the Beaux-Arts tradition. Peacock and Beulay, who, as it happens, were the successors to Jethro Cossins. The firm was Cossins, Peacock and Beulay for years. Um, but here, not, not at their best in the mechanical engineering building. But you'll notice it's still formal. There isn't much else you can say about it, except that it has this wonderful William Bloy sculptured frieze, one of his finest later works. Bloy, towards the end of his career, stops doing these low-relief uh, sculptures, rather in the manner of Eric Gill. He was trained by Gill. Uh, and, and tends to go to a much looser three-dimensional style, probably under the influence of Epstein. Or if you know the Bolton Bottom Murdoch uh, in Broad Street, uh, that's almost his last work. Uh, but here, he goes back to his original manner in a very stylized way. I'll show you, I'll show you close up in a moment. The, the, um, the, the shaft of lightning through the wheel represents electrical and mechanical engineering. And either side, there are these wonderful groups of students and teachers which need to be looked at at some length. First of all, he's banging up to date. Will you notice the student in the duffel coat, which in 1954 was very trendy um, and, and fashionable for a student to have? Um, Secondly, there's all little subtleties. On both panels, only the teacher's head just breaks the, up, just breaks the upper framing. And if you look on, uh, just a little touch of hierarchy, so if you look on this, the teacher, there he is in his gown, the, the don. Uh, his head just breaks the upper framing, whereas the others don't. As for the figures, these extremely sort of elegant young men, I, I, I'm never sure with Doyle. He's a mysterious figure. We don't know much about him. He lived for his work. And I, I do not know whether they're just enormously stylized and slightly Egyptianized in the, way, in the way of Eric Gill, or whether the whole thing is crackling with gay sexuality. <laughs> I, I, I've puzzled myself over this frieze for years, but it's a wonderful piece. And, and there it stands. It's rather like the, the Aesculapius over the medical school. It's an absolutely gorgeous piece of sculpture, and it sits there unnoticed by anybody. Um, this is noticed by an awful lot of people. <laughs> This is the library. Um, the most crass decision of the post-war years, and it predated 
the great post-war plan for the university they had to accept, which just predated it, was the decision to build the library slap across the main axis of the university. There is a proposal at the moment to build a new library off this axis, which some of us give three cheers. Um, I hope that will happen. Werner Rees, by the time he did this, he was quite an architect in the 30s, was tired. And this is obviously a Beaux-Arts and a classical building. You can see classical building behind those pilasters. But the detailing is quite bluntly ugly. Uh, I've seen step backs in the form of a cornice done far more elegantly like that. If you want to see better ones, you can look at those Bill Hayward lodges on Bridges Road. And the cornice is a horrible thing with a coving and then a, a, a cornice or a, a, a step out that actually cants upwards. I've never seen anything quite so ugly. So for me, it passes if it passes unlamented. Um, and then one last thing, this is the last bit of William Bloy, the mermaid fountain, which I thought I couldn't not put in because it's, it's such a symbolic figure of things for the university. Notice the wonderful sculptured bowl, sort of almost prim primitive art, sort of turning into some old form of life. And then this tremendous mermaid rising out of it. I think that the, the bottom of it, the waves out of which she rises, which are sculpted, as you can see, in, in bronze and, and copper, and, uh, with tiny ends, are, are really rather extraordinary. Um, the astonishing thing about Bloy was he is so prolific, yet he's always so good. Um, if you ever go into the Hall of Memory and see the Bloy friezes, which are up above the wall, um, when I did the Birmingham Pepsner, uh, we had a photograph of one of those, which is in the book. And when that went round the illustrations meeting with all the Pepsner uh, grandees there, Bridget Cherry, John Newman, it was fascinating to watch jaws drop as this photograph went round the room. And it duly went in, and it was borrowed for the invitation card. He is extremely good. He's a Birmingham treasure. Okay. Ah, and here we change. I thought I'd, I thought I'd change typeface to something nice, nice and sixties, like Franklin Gothic, mm -hmm. um, because here we change gear with vengeance. Um, Elaine Harwood is the is the national historian of post-war architecture and working on what will be the standard work. Um, and her comment on, on Birmingham view is: as a concentrated experience of 1960s university architecture, Birmingham remains hard to beat. And there's a bit of it. Um, but it starts not on the university, but with the veil. 1956, Casson and Condor, Sir Hugh Casson um, and his partner Neville Condor, with the tree expert, the planting expert Mary Mitchell, started a landscaping plan for the new halls of residence on the veil. There it is, with the Great Lake. And this is not Beaux Arts, this is the rejection of Beaux Arts, it's the English picturesque tradition, the, the tradition of 18th century landscape gardeners like. Bertie Brown, Humphrey Repton, um, brought into the service of modern architecture. And Sir Nicholas Pevsner, he who uh, almost created architectural history in this country, started the guides I worked for, his comment, this was about Walter Gropius's infant in Village College, that it's beautiful. Austerity of forms he looked for in modern architecture, but humanising those forms by their free, happy grouping and their placing amid lawn and trees. <laughs> so that's what we are about and there's a placing within lawn and trees. I've only had that kind of shadowy day when I was going around the Hemisong. Mm -hmm. so that's, when you, that's when you see it like you and Caston's. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's Neville Condor's little bridge. I put 956, that's when you designed it, which I have to build slightly later. But if you see those lovely little circular wooden, it's very good timber because it's still very solid after 50 years more. Um, Little bars, there's some more down by Trussell Park Road, that Condor's design. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look at those buildings later, but you can just see High Hall as it used to be through the trees. Okay. So that's where we start. And here is well, here's part of Ridge Hall, just the detail. This won't be with us much longer. It starts with a Birmingham firm of architects, Harvey and Wicks, famous Bourneville, just before they finally folded, and they, they folded into Jackson Edmund, another Birmingham firm. So the, the building was done by both. Um, I think it's better than, it, than it's made out to be. It's massed very well to, to, to relate to the veil, uh, which won't be the case with its successor. And it does have some nice little details, like this little cupola, which is really a ventilation column over the ridge hall. But the best building over there, and the one that survived all the recent rebuildings, is what was Widrington and Blake, it's now called Shackleton. I think it's still called Shackleton. Um, it's by one of the great architects who came out of the sort of Festival of Britain generation, H.T., always called Jim Cadbury Brown. 
um, a couple of his good works are here. This is very much the start of what we are going to call brutalism. The use of the expressive use of concrete, that great concrete deck that comes out of the first floor, coming out, and the building cantilevered over it. The use of rather tough brick to contrast with the concrete. The very discreet and noticeable punchy shapes, those, those ends, very cubic ends that, that, that aren't joined, well, they're recessed in the middle. Um, and there is a canted bay coming out on the side, just to give a bit more angular <coughs> life to the design. Um, this is very much the, the, the architecture, not the early modern architecture of Britain, but when the university is particularly Birmingham caught up, we are into the 60s and a much tougher aesthetic. It arrives at the university with the University Centre and Staff House, which is by Neville Conder, Hugh Casson's partner, 1958-62. It's been rather altered, and that dark colouring on the top of the University Centre is not original. Um, there's a lovely little, though, counted aureole um, stuck just between them. I don't you can see that bay coming out between the University Centre and Staff House, which is a very nice feature. Uh, and it still has some nice details. This is the side staircase, which again, I don't think people notice, the University Centre. Uh, that's a wonderful little conceit, really out of the Baroque. Um, do remember, architects at this time still had classes in history of architecture. They knew it. You go into that staircase, you are surrounded by those almost semicircular walls, and you have to walk around one side or the other. The staircase divides and then goes up over an access road, the final bit of the bridge. That's the point of having it. <coughs> There's a reason to be there, uh, to get you into the building. Um, rather early, I, I don't think this is of the same quality. Uh, Elaine Harvard rather likes it, I don't. I find that upper, that cantilever up the floor rather menacing. The Biosciences Building by Clayman Lacey is much earlier than people think, it's 1960. I think only that uh, sort of mosaic, almost mosaic y cladding gives the, gives the day to one. Um, and here's one of the, the other great buildings of the 60s at the University, Ashley and Strathcona by Howell Killett, Partridge and Amis. Like a lot of the other firms there, they have, uh, Howell had something to do with the Festival of Britain, and they all came out of the LCC architects, the old London County Council Architects Department, where Sir Leslie Martin, as he later became, um, trained many of the modernist architects of Britain. Uh, this is a wonderful conceit. You can't, I suppose I really have to try to find a plan of it, because you have a circular building, tall building, actually, with another low building, which isn't straight. It snakes round it in a curve, a rather complicated curve. Uh, Strathcona here on the left. But this morning, just some details. There's the elevation of Strathcona, all ins and outs, very, very chunky, um, with the windows recessed, uh, a big band between them, and some sort of beam ends looking like immense core balls come out below it. Um, here is a gorgeous uh, spiral staircase on the end of one building, the end of Strathcona. Uh, very sculptural a really quite tremendous piece of, of sort of almost sculptural art between those two curving, they are curved, this isn't the photograph, ends of the building. Everything curves at that point. And the internal staircase, which I think is quite a tremendous thing, with a great curving stair that goes right up. I can't quite get down to the ground floor on this. Someone wondered why there was me lying on the floor mm -hmm. uh, pointing my camera up, but I got some strange looks taking this photograph. Uh, but there it is, right up the lantern at the top. Um, it's a wonderful uh, three-dimensional space inside there. Another building, this is probably won't last much longer, but a very chunky piece by Chamberlain Powell and Bond, best known for Barbican in London and, and uh, Newhall, now Murray Edwards in Cambridge. Again, the, the brutalist language, the tough language, the concrete, the tough brick, uh, the beams of the ceiling brought out as enormous great brackets or core walls underneath a great big concrete slab. Um, and on the other side, a most wonderful roofscape of these cut-off roof lights. Um, this was the one of Chamberlain Powell and Bond's particular little motifs. They used it at New Hall. Um, and um, this will be a very sad loss when it goes. Can you see that there's the ones nearer us, there's another row of them higher up at the back, uh, and there's some bigger ones facing in a different direction on the left. It's the most extraordinary uh, roofscape of, of, of almost sort of sculptural objects. It's like going through an abstract sculpture gallery. Um, famous for other reasons, this is a constructional triumph of Metallurgy and Materials Building by Philip Dowson, the Arab Associate. Sir Philip Dowson, I should say, he's still with us, he's 90 something. Um, 
the interest there is the, is, the, is the construction of the modern building with the tartan grid, the services all put into the grid uh, in, uh, and expressed by those, those cores with the little turret tops. But it does have a bit of architecture and if you walk north from the campus around the edge of it you go through this rather nicely managed cloister. Um, the next gate building next to it, which I'll finish with in a minute, um, doesn't do it any favours, but this is <coughs> rather nice. Um, and then the School of Education, which is Cass and Condor and Partners, major intervention in the university themselves, a building of various faces. Here it is from the entrance side, where you can see it's an atrium building, which became fashionable much later, like the what was the BT building, because it's still the BT building in Brindley Place, it's an atrium building of the same way. Uh, you can actually see the glass the glass bit in the middle, which is what lights the central atrium between the two blocks in front. But if you look at it from the other angle, it sort of groups almost like a hill village with, with, with towers and turrets almost implied in, in this. And there you can see perhaps a Hugh Casson's uh, picturesque habit of, doing, of, of painting his watercolours of historic scenes, because there's, there's an Italian hill town behind that somewhere. I, I, kid, I kid you not, you know, the sort of thing that Cass, Casson used to paint. Um, and, of course, I couldn't not do the other Philip Dowson building, the Muirhead Tower, the ultimate brutalist uh, building of the university. It is, as I've criticised the university, can I say it's a great tribute to the university that though this building is not listed, they have kept it and refurbed it, unlike a certain city council and the central mm -hmm. library. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the uni has kept me ahead and has refurbed it. Um, absolutely, you know, all the construction displayed on the outside, tremendous concrete beams and the rough texturing of concrete. Here's a detail to show you the aggregate all of, the, of which the concrete is made, all very, very... Uh, loudly displayed. That's very much the, the, the aesthetic of Brutalism. It, it, was, it was to accept concrete as a building material, to say how would you build in concrete, just like a, you know, a, a 17th century builder might build in timber and produce an entire style of timber work architecture, you know, love, love loan, that sort of thing. What would the equivalent be in concrete? Let us try and design a style for concrete, for a, a, a design buildings for concrete. This is what you get. That funny little box actually has the job of taking the rainwater from the plaza across the open gap of the underground car park, which you can just see in that, and, and safely to ground and, and where it can trickle away on the other side. So it is functional, that bit of box work. And one last building of the great phase, uh, the J.G. Smith Building, the Institute of Local Government, Cass and Condor and Partners, Still the same materials as the Student School of Education. Notice it's got a bit chunkier with those very explicit, almost traditional brick buttresses holding up the ground floor. So Cass and Condo were going that way at the end. I'm running a bit late, so the next section will go very quickly. But I did want briefly to mention the buildings which the university has caught up in its, in its, in its uh, expansion. Victorian villas like Westmere, about 1850 on Edgbaston Park Road, but two wonderful arts and crafts houses. The Garth House, WH Bidlake's finest house, the finest arts and crafts house in Birmingham, with what's happened to the other great Bidlake house, the Yates House that we know in Four Oaks, the disasters that have happened to that. Um, this is now even more precious. 1901, um, very modern, to most people, but perhaps 1930s, to look closely. Um, the render gives it a particular cool, which is of its own particular flavour. And the composition, which is very picturesque, but quite powerful in its way. There's the wonderful little entrance to the stable court and the, and the, and the, and the gardener's court, or coachman's cottage. Note the eyebrow dormer, the curvy dormer. Um, and there's the inside, where it has an entrance hall. The hall is a room with an Inglenook fireplace and the staircase going up behind a line of octagonal columns. And the other great one is Winterbourne. Uh, again, this time more typical Dale Ball, not so sort of cool, but, but a tough building using rather more obviously traditional methods, like all that brick, up, brick decoration. And again, a wonderful inside with a long entrance hall, and the plaster work, there's a detail of it, is by George Bankhart, he who did the plaster work in the Great Hall, I'd say, come back to him. Um, um, arts and crafts, this is, this is handmade <coughs> plaster work, this is a hand-carved mould, and you put plaster into it. This is a bar, you know, artistic stuff. 
And two last ones, very quickly, not as good as those, but nine Pritchett's Road by Crossing to Peacock and Bulay, 1905. <coughs> and a rather later one by one of the great later Artscraft architects, minor work but nice to have it, Edwin F. Reynolds, 13 Pritchett's Road of 1927. If you want to see Reynolds at his best, you need to go to such an old place as Pipe Hayes Church, St Mary's. Um, right, and then a quick look at the later buildings of the university. This has to be very quick. Birmingham U doesn't have much in the way of the various styles of the 80s and 90s, the traditional revival and postmodernism. This is the best the traditional revival gets to, and I like this much in its way. If you look round the back, you can see it's one of those buildings where they put a brick cladding on, um, on, on a steel structure, and you can see how the brick piers <laughs> really have a steel structure underneath, which is never very impressive. But the front is a wonderful little fantasy of the style of Holland Hobbes. Those round arch doorways are what Hobbes did in all sorts of places, as indeed are those stone, stone orioles. And it's rather good of Rathbone Brown, I think it's David Rathbone, to, do, to produce this wonderful little... Um, um, return to Hobbes in the 1990s. So I think this is an underestimated building. One that certainly isn't is this awful thing, which is the nearest Birmingham University gets to postmodern. And, and Elaine Harwood calls this gross, and I think that's probably the best word for it. It really is not um, uh, anyone at their best, but that's postmod if you want it. And then on, of course, to high tech where there are some rather more respectable examples and sort of that and the sort of modern cool type of architecture. Uh, firstly, the Netscape building, which isn't a happy neighbour to metallic, metallurgy and materials because it's too close to its cloister, but has its own very sort of, uh, very sort of like icy cold elegance, uh, very much a, a 90s thing. Um, and this is also a building full, you know, a building full of cool. Um, Everything is perfectly square, the angles are noticeable, the surfaces are always so sheer. Um, even if it comes out in front of it, it's with very precise sort of metallic structures in front of it. Um, and what the worry one has about this kind of building is that it's tremendously elegant, but when you look for something else apart from the elegance, I'm not sure it's there. Um, but it is, you know, Compton, Peace and Field and Clegg, are one of the better firms of architects in Britain. Um, and since then, there seems to have been quite a pause. There is now quite a development scheme, which might involve a new library. But the last thing I can show you is another bit of the hemicycle, which has been done very recently by a very prestigious local firm, Glenn Howells Architects, the Bramall Music Building of 19, 2010. Um, everything except that right-hand dome on that picture is new. Um, so they built an entire dome section with a new dome, four new turrets, and then an infill section with the recessed arches to its right. Um, it's all beautifully done. I just quibble slightly at the proportions of those great glazed entrances, which aren't Aston Webb, though I know they work very nicely inside. Um, even when you get a piece of a, a, a very tactful infill like this, that, that sort of hint of early 21st century cool is certainly around. I, I, I find it uninviting, but, but I know other people like it very much. But anyway, with this rather nice piece of infill in the hemicycle, uh, the current architectural history of the university comes to an end.